with a mission to unite healthcare leaders and digital health innovators to advance musculoskeletal care. Our next guest shares his journey of becoming an internationally recognized leader who has inspired so many to move the industry forward. Dr. Stefan Obini, founder and chair of the Digital Orthopedics Conference, joins us today to discuss when he became passionate about digital health technology and why orthopedic medicine is ideal for it. Additionally, Dr. Beanie outlines the unique aspects of his annual conference and how you can get involved. Join us for this fun and imaginative conversation with one of the brightest minds in the healthcare industry. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Dr. Beanie, welcome to our podcast and given my admiration for your work and mission in moving digital health forward, I am so honored to be speaking with you today. Mike, it's just a pleasure. I've been so excited to get the invitation. I'm like, oh my God, Mike Mazzelli's invited me. I hit the big time. (laughs) I feel the same way, my friend, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today regarding your passion and deep mission in founding and leading the Digital Orthopedics Conference, what you and the community are accomplishing and how our community can get involved. But before we dive into this conversation that I know is going to be chock full energy, a bit of housekeeping, while listening to any of our episodes, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast so you will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And lastly, please visit the bottom of the episode notes to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Clubhouse in order to further the conversations occurring on this podcast. All right, Stefano, it's almost time for our community to learn how DocSF is uniting innovators and healthcare leaders to adopt and integrate digital health solutions in musculoskeletal care. But first, I'm going to randomly select an icebreaker question so we can get to know you personally. Oh, buddy, we're talking food. What's your favorite meal and why? Just knew you you can interview an Italian. You're asking what's your favorite thing. It's going to be around food, right? So the question pile may have been tilted and skewed towards food, knowing you're Italian. I'm just going to throw it out there. Zelly, I know you've got some reference to that. (laughs) Look, I am from Bologna, and one of the greatest things you can ever have is tagliatelle a ragù in Bologna. Just the way we make it there, the handmade tagliatella is just unique and special. You can't go more than 10 kilometers out of town and get it the same. And that's a very close call, though, with tortellini. So I'm not 100% sure which one I pick of the two, but definitely one of those two. Let's go back to that first one. Can you say that one more time? I know it's not tagliatelle, by the way. It's tagliatelle al ragù and bolognese, a ragù bolognese. Tagliatelle al ragù bolognese. Why I have to say bolognese? Because in Bologna, we make it slightly different than we do in the rest of Italy. And there's a whole school of thought that adds a little cream at the end to just dull out the spiciness of the meat that are in there. And that has to be cooked over slow heat for three hours or more. The the exact ratio of the pork to the beef is a matter of much, much debate. The weight's round, uh, whether or not you add any mortadella or I mean a prosciutto in there to, to add a little flavor. It's an art form. I had an aunt who had a restaurant. She refused to give me the recipe. She said, if you want to, you may be my nephew, but if you want to learn the recipe, you have to go sit in the kitchen for four hours with the cooks and then you'll know the recipe. And that's exactly what I did. Oh my gosh. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. I tell you, I know we're still locked down here in the pandemic and we're doing our part to socially distant, but I tell you, I cannot wait to get back out, travel the world again. Some of my favorite memories of traveling are in Italy. It is just unbelievable. I, it's amazing. <laughs> I was in Rome. I kid you not. I can't believe I'm sharing this on a podcast, but I'm going to do it. So I'm in Rome. We just go into this hole in the wall restaurant, right? That, I don't even know if there was a name on the front door. We walk in. That's what we typically do while traveling, right? We walk in. I order this lasagna and it was so good, Stefano. I ordered another one. My family was so <laughs> embarrassed and I'm like, I got to do it. This is the best lasagna I've ever had. I'm going to so order another relate. one. I can so and, relate. I've done that so many times. I wanted the same thing I just had. What? Yeah, I'm just going to do it again. Thing. Again. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm times that happened to me. One, I had a risotto in the Veneto region near outside of Venice, at the town called Verona, where they're very big on wine, et cetera. And there was a risotto made at the base of it was a uh, Marone. I'm like, what? And this thing came and it was a revelation. Oh my God, I just got to have it again. They're like, no. I'm like, yes, yes, you must have it. So they get brought it again. And then I went back and said, you know, I must have the recipe. Look, at, I'm a private citizen. I'm not going to copy it. They refused to give me the recipe. So you know what I did? I had a very attractive friend in that town and I sent her to, and of course she got the recipe. <laughs> Well, sometimes you got to do what you got to do to get those recipes, but then they do hold them close to the chest in regards to sharing their secrets in the kitchen. So yeah, I couldn't believe that I ordered. I don't know if I've ever done that before or after order the same entree again. So it's one of the Italian food, unbelievable. So, well, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Beanie. I do appreciate it. And I can't wait for our community to learn more about all the wonderful work happening with Doc SF after we get back from thanking our community champion sponsor. With rising burnout, malpractice, digital and personal risks, clinicians face greater than a million dollar liability. And in today's climate, busy frontline healthcare workers don't have the capacity to attend to these risky blind spots. But the AdaptTrack team is bringing hope and solutions to the healthcare industry. AdaptTrack's mission is to help clinicians and their practice teams work and live better. AdaptTrack's 30 second nudges unlock category one, continuing medical education credits, along with insurance savings while meeting the busy clinician where they are. On Clubhouse, during weekend nature walks, through all of helps from this podcast and over 3,000 additional work-life moments. To learn more about AdaptTrack and how you can engage in active learning that drives a 5X plus ROI, a 30X time savings, and an experience clinicians will love, head over to AdaptTrack.com or visit the top of the episode notes and click on their link. We are back with Dr. Stefan Obini, founder and chair of Digital Orthopedics Conference, or Doc SF. An amazing conference, incredible work happening out there in California. Stefano, there's a lot to cover your career. We could probably have an entire series of podcasts around your incredible work, your mission, your journey in moving the health of our communities forward. And I know today we're really going to focus in on Doc SF. You do have some news about the upcoming conference. We'll share that as well. But share a little bit of your journey of how you became an orthopedic surgeon, how you came into this space, and then where those light bulbs started going off about this notion of digital therapeutics and the convergence of orthopedics, what's happening with DocSF, why is this important? Then, of course, we'll talk a little future state. Where do you see this movement continuing to move toward this notion and this convergence of digital therapeutics, orthopedics, why it's important, where we're going to be heading as an industry, and why DocSF will continue to lead the charge. But for now, take us back. Share with us that journey of how you got to where you are today and launching DocSF and why you're so passionate around this space. Sounds good, man. I will start this back in 1747. (laughs) (laughs) So this is episode one of 44. (laughs) 44. We have a lot of fun. Sit back, get some coffee. Now, look, I was an orthopedic resident. Then I became a fellow. Then I did my training. I went to most of the University of California, San Francisco. But in the late 90s, I went to Italy to do my training to finish up getting an international perspective on orthopedic surgery, came back in the, I see, I think it was the fall of 1997. The world in San Francisco was on fire. It felt like being on the edge, on the very crest of a massive wave. Those Hawaiian waves look like they're going to take out the whole island. And that the world was changing drastically. The energy in San Francisco was unbelievable. It was palpable. And then here I'm a doctor and everybody else is talking about Heck, and I'm like, oh, I need to get involved with this somehow. And I wound up starting a small company. Two, actually, one had nothing to do with healthcare, but it was in the technology space. And that got me a little bit of experience in it. And I actually ran it. But the other was in a little company that had this crazy premise that patients would actually rate doctors. And in 1997, that idea was so anathema that we couldn't even get a hearing at a VC company. And just to give you a sense of how far back 25 years ago, the mindset was around digital health and digital orthopedics. I want to take in a bit of hiatus. I went to work at Kaiser Permanente, got very involved with administration and running, helping to run that organization as an orthopedic surgeon, but also a physician leader. And that gave me a lot of insight into the challenges of running organizations, running businesses, running healthcare and managing patients. 
without technology. Now, what also happened was that at the same time, the background, some people were starting to say, well, all this tech could be applied to healthcare. And digital health as a concept started rising in the late, in the early 2005, 7, 8, 9, 10, as you know, you were part of this. And I started getting more and more interested in it. And I was part of the California Healthcare Foundation Fellowship Program, which is a really remarkable two-year educational process. And I had to pick a project. And I learned about a small company that was a startup at the time in Chicago that had an asynchronous technology that allowed us to share videos with patients. And we did a little research project doing virtual physical therapy with an asynchronous platform. And we saw a 60% reduction in utilization of resources and a massive uptake by the patients to the point where one patient randomized into the platform one time and then randomized out of the platform the second time the second time, got into a huge argument with my staff to the point that I had to let him access the software because he was so upset that he couldn't get it because he found it to be so beneficial. And at that point, I wrote up the research paper. It got lots of attention. And that got me in front of a number of audiences in the digital health space and started going to conferences and meetings. And suddenly here I am, an academic orthopedic surgeon who's going to orthopedic events where there's maybe whatever, five, 10,000 people talk about orthopedic surgery. And now they're going to digital health conferences, there's five or 10,000 people talking about technology, both trying to solve the same problems, but not talking to each other. Now, there's never any tech people on the medical side, there are never any medical people on the tech side, unless, of course, those medical people were starting their own companies. That was pretty much the only interface. And about that time, I was transitioning from Kaiser Permanente, where I spent 18 years, to more academic practice at UCSF. And along with my chairman, Dr. Vale, at the time, I said, look, there's a real opportunity to create an environment, a place where we can bring together all the stakeholders in healthcare and ask them to focus on orthopedics. Why orthopedics? Orthopedics has short cycle times. It has fewer variables, mostly dealing with healthy patients. It's quite expensive. So it has all the variables where if you're a startup and you're trying to prove concept, that's a great place to start. Oh, and by the way, Medicare and all the insurers are looking at this space as a place where they can try new alternate alternative payment models and new ways of managing healthcare costs in this country, as well as quality. It's just a really perfect environment within which to test some of these technology ideas. Oh, and by the way, little known fact, it's about one-fifth of the Medicare spend is on some type of musculoskeletal care. So it's not exactly a small market. It's a massive market. It's a worldwide market. It impacts everything from wellness, motion, stretching, all the way to major trauma, large operations. The entire musculoskeletal system is encompassed by musculoskeletal care and therefore orthopedic surgery. So here is this perfect little nexus of technology that can be applied to a problem. Because if you think a little bit about most of the events you and I attend, somebody gets up on stage and tells you how fantastic the future is going to be. They don't spend an awful lot of time on how we're going to actually get there. And then anybody working in the space on a day-to-day basis, as I do as the chief technology officer of my department, trying to actually implement this technology, where do I go to learn about how to get this approved by the CTO of the hospital, the CFO of the hospital? How do I learn about how to create a appropriate business case for implementation? Where do I learn about the policy and the politics behind these things at the state and federal level that may or may not support the implementation of a specific technology, right? And if I'm actually a clinician in the trenches trying to get through my day, where am I going to find information curated set of data points about the best technologies that actually will influence and improve the way I deliver care in the musculoskeletal space. All those questions are coming up as I'm sitting here with one foot in clinical orthopedic and one foot in digital health. And we saw where do all these people that need to have these conversations come together? Well, as you know, JP Morgan every year in San Francisco draws a tremendous number of high level, very intelligent, very bright, very interested, very keen people into the San Francisco Bay Area. And so we said, well, why don't we just use that as our standing point and just see if we can 
connect everybody at through the Digital Earth Conference, the UCSF Digital Earth Peace Conference, San Francisco, at that around that time. So that was the genesis of Digital Earth Peace Conference, San Francisco, to bring together all the leaders in healthcare, have them have a conversation about how to implement these technologies. Because frankly, VCs don't frequently talk to healthcare execs. Healthcare execs don't talk to technology companies, et cetera, but bring them all together, have that conversation. That was about 2005 or six, I think, when we had our first one. And no, sorry, 15 or 16, we had our first one. And that was the genesis. One more thing I want to mention about Digital Face Conference San Francisco that makes it unique and different. Not only do we focus specifically on the implementation of technology, we have a couple of lectures here and there about the future will bring, but it's not about that. It's about what works today, what is shovel ready has been used as terminology, how it works, why it works, and what you can expect from it. But we also realized that shiny new things don't run themselves. Having had 15 years of leadership under my belt, managing departments, managing hospitals, managing groups of hospitals, or helping to, I should say, you need to not only have the right technology for the right problem, but you also need to invest a tremendous amount into leading that change, that change at the hospital level, at the group level, at the individual physician, but also technician, medical assistant level, everyone has to agree that this is the appropriate solution for that problem and agree to change their practices to make that happen. So we include and integrate leadership and leadership modalities within DocSF. We had a great partner to do that, including BTS, a big multinational consulting firm, but also we've had great help from IDEO that has come through and given our community lots and lots of information in that space. The last piece that's missing that people need to have understanding of is policy. What is actually happening in Washington, D.C.? Where is Medicare going? Right? Where are the insurers going? What's the law going to change to enable these technologies? Because you need to know that that's coming upstream so that you know that your technology will have a chance to see the light of day in the hospital. So things like the change in the payment models, we heard about it right off the bat, where our audience was aware there would soon be payments for telehealth. We talked a lot about the transition to outpatient care way before it happened because we knew those legal elements passing the way through Congress. So that was DOCSF in a nutshell, a conference that intended to bring together the various voices and stakeholders in healthcare around a common problem, which is not a small one because musculoskeletal, as I mentioned, is one-fifth of Medicare spend. And at the same time, give them the tools they need to learn how to lead that change and understand the context within which that change needs to happen. While at the same time, we've handpicked several companies that we feel are representative of technologies that are super exciting, well-applied, that anybody can use in that group. The last thing I'll say is that even though we focus on orthopedic surgery, keep in mind that just because we're focusing on one element of the entire surgical suite, these technologies and the way you apply them and the challenges in application that we talk about apply to all the surgical specialties and in some broader sense to all the medical specialties as well. But just because the word orthopedics is in there should not impede folks who run hospitals with multiple specialties from participating. It's just a good way to take one problem and see how to solve it. Well, thank you for that, Stefano. I do appreciate it. And it's an exciting one. I've personally entered the industry after, and I know we're both Stanford alums, after I was a fortunate opportunity to play football for the Cardinal. Yeah, go Cardinal. Yeah, go Cardinal. I graduated during the dot-com bust in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there weren't a lot of technology jobs around in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So that's actually how I got into healthcare was through the medical device and orthopedic space. I'm sure you know companies like Smith & Nephew or Nuvasiv, a spine company. Those are the companies that I kind of cut my teeth on in the industry years and years ago. But to your point, and what I'm also interested in, uh, Stefano, is this notion of orthopedics and this notion of digital Did people, when you first started seeing these trend lines where you were mentioning you had one foot in the orthopedic world, you had another foot in this technology and digital world, did peers, did colleagues, did the industry kind of at large look back at you and think, what are you talking about? Maybe they looked a little bit like deer in headlights look because innovators like yourself, you see things well before the masses do. So when you first started seeing these trend lines of where this convergence of digital and orthopedics was and is and is now happening. Were colleagues in the industry looking at you a little dumbfounded? You're talking about deer in the headlights. We had the headlights. There was no deer to put in there. <laughs> there was so 
I would go to the booths at the academy and I'd just go from big company to big company trying to drum up support for this. And I'd say, hey, who's in charge of digital innovation in your company? And I get this blank stare. But what is digital innovation? Why do we care? So there were certainly a couple of forward thinking companies that were just like, talk more about that. We know it's coming. But you're right. I have a lot of talks that I give on this topic and occasionally I, have, I throw in a slide of a train coming down the, the tracks. You kind of see it coming, but you don't realize how fast it's going until it passes you by. And my argument is often, look, you have to understand this train is not stopping just because you guys are a little behind. This is an opportunity to see it coming. It's a great train to get on. It's going the right direction, but you've got to start running now if you want to get on. It's not stopping at the station until you guys get your act together. So that's important for people to understand. It's also important for clinicians to understand. This is changing the way patients consume healthcare in a way that if physicians don't understand it, follow along, adapt and adopt, rather than leading the change, the change would be led for them. And that's not a good place to be. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And so let's dive in a little bit now. Current yeah. state, Stefano, in regards to, you mentioned some amazing organizations that are working alongside you with DocSF, yes. like IDEO. I mean, it's just incredible brands, incredible leaders. What makes this conference, and I know it's probably going to be virtual, we're going to talk about this year's conference, but even in past years, and then moving forward after we get through this pandemic, what makes this event, this conference, the happenings around it so unique and special and different? Again, like I said, you already kind of teed us up a bit in regards to some yeah. of the organizations helping along there. But yeah. for instance, I'll even just tee up a little bit more and have you answer the question. For instance, I'm a big Peloton user. I saw right. Matt Wilpers, one of the key instructors that I take his classes a lot. I saw him at a previous Doc SF event. I was like, that is so cool. Talk about having these varying minds and different viewpoints, but having an instructor from Peloton come join, how cool. Give us a little bit of a viewpoint of what makes it unique when you convene everybody around this Doc SF conference. Right. Well, listen, yeah, Matt Wilpers was amazing. We could go there. This is something that I believe strong in is in order to create a conversation that I think is useful or useful to me, I guess everybody brings their own opinions to these conferences, they run them, is I need to hear different points of view. I don't want to be in an echo chamber. But one of the things that I hear when we were in person constantly hear from people was that was the best use of my time in years. And the reason I may or may not have been a lecture they heard, often it was somebody that sat next to who is not from their industry. It is incredible how IDEO looks at a problem, right? Same problem, same challenges, but the way they bring solutions and the teacher bring solutions is phenomenal. But the same is also true when I sit next to an insurance exec that explains to me why they don't invest in preemptive care. And suddenly you go, oh, okay, now that makes sense. Or why a technology company may have chosen to go a certain direction or another, like, oh, now it makes sense. And the more information you have from more different viewpoints, the better it is. So we try to bake that into your experience at DocSF. When we went virtual in April of 2019, at the beginning, we were one of the very, very first groups to do a virtual event. And we had partnered with the American Academy, orthopedic surgery, and we had something like 6,000 people sign up because we focused it on the digital tools we could use to help deal with COVID-19. That was another time when we brought in disparate voices to give us a whole new perspective. And to me, data and information are tools we can all use. It gives you an hour momentarium of technologies that you can apply. So what are we doing as we move from the in-person where we have all these wonderful connections between people to virtual? How do you recreate a virtual environment and do so on the budget that we have, which is not by no means what some of these bigger organizations have accessible to them? And so what we did is we re-envisioned our conference. This is going to be a digital first event, right? Well, let's not think about it as an analog event we're trying to digitize. We're going to try to, or digitalize, we're going to try to rethink the model. Well, when we're watching a podcast or watching a video, whatever, online, a Zoom, we take breaks and we need to check email and we need to be able to pop in and out of a conference based on what our interests are. So we said, okay, let's break all the segments into one hour chunks so that you can watch them on demand. You can watch them real time, but they stand alone. They don't require you to be there all day to examine them. We have 20 minute breaks in between, but let's make those breaks entertaining. So we have 
the Truffle Brothers going over how to make truffle risotto. We've got an amazing musician from New York who's one of the most amazing violinists out here. We have a talk completely dedicated to that follows a bias in AI talk to bias in just clinical care and bias in the way we interface with clinicians and lack or inadequate care for minorities. We have that in as well. So we integrated these other elements into the conference that are going to bring in a little bit of a mind break so that you have a chance to relax a little bit and think outside the box while you're listening to these conversations. And at the same time, give you an opportunity to take a break and come in and out of the conference. The other two things I'm very excited about, besides the lectures on various technologies that are applicable to orthopedic care and where they are in this day, is there are three really cool events. One is we called it Voices. We're actually asking some of the members of our community to talk about their experience of how they actually implemented technology, what problem they're going to solve, what technology they implemented, how they did it, what they learned, right? Because that is really where we learn, not so much from some salesperson from a company, but from someone, one of our peers, someone in our shoes who had to solve the same problems we have. So we have the voices of Dr. Sab, which I'm really excited about. Another is the bone tank. It's going to be a little different. It's a bit like the shark tank, but it's much more benign. <laughs> Just a bone tank. <laughs> and we have these startups. They're going to present into three leaders, a VC and someone who's run a company and someone who's run an event and also one of our PhDs from UCLA to talk a little bit about and actually make a pitch. And the reason for that is we want people to understand when they listen to these amazing companies, what kinds of questions they should be asking, right? So again, teaching you not just about the company, but also learn how to be approached by them and kind of questions to ask them. And another really cool segment we're having here is going to be a sort of a COVID-19 update. We had such a tremendous response to the COVID-19 segments that we had in April, that this, we're going to bring the same speakers back to give us quick updates of what they need to add to the talks from last April that will bring us up to date on the latest and greatest about COVID-19, both in the United States and elsewhere. So that's the April event, and I'm really excited about it. So exciting. And we're going to talk about the April event in just a moment and where our community that has rallied around passionate pioneers can get involved. We'll get to that in just a moment. But of course, Stefano, as you know, And both of our podcasts are part of the Health Podcast Network and all the wonderful work happening with Dan Kendall. We have some of the brightest and most passionate and mission-driven minds and leaders that are rallied around our podcast to continue to move healthcare forward. And so with that, uh, Stefano, what is one problem, need, or question that you and your team have that maybe we can be helping you with? And again, after that, we'll also talk about where we can find you online, more information about this year's conference, et cetera. But for now, what is one problem, need, or question that we can be helping you with? Well, I appreciate the offer and your audience, anybody who's willing to take me up on the request, I would be really grateful. The concept of running a digital case conference, as you mentioned earlier, is kind of weird. It's we're focusing on a narrow vertical. It's about the here and now and of the future, but it's so practically useful. And so we'd like to get people to know we're there. And if they're interested to participate, the people we're looking for are the kinds of folks that don't take no for an answer. If they were told something can't be done, they're going to go figure out a way to do it. It's the kind of person that said, if somebody said knowledge is finite, they say, no, there's more to be learned. If there's an opportunity that hasn't had a solution yet, the kind of people that are going to say, let me look, those are the folks we want to try to drive to this conference because they'll find like minds whose goal is to streamline and catalyze adoption of these technologies within healthcare. And then we happen to be using orthopedics as the catalyst, but it could be applied to anywhere. So as if you go on LinkedIn or Twitter and you see our, I don't call them ads, but our notices, notifications, pass them on, retweet them, talk about it to your friends. We've made it free. There's a free registration up until a week before the event because we know COVID-19 had impact on folks and we want to not put up a limit to accessing this content. So yeah, promote us and be part of us and join the community. That is the biggest ask I could have of the community. I love it. Well, we definitely have quite a few of those leaders around this podcast that are definitely yes, not do. taking no for an answer. Well, so with that, where can we find all this good stuff online? Not only those LinkedIn social media handles or websites, but then also share what are the dates? What are the dates for this year's annual experience and how we can register and all that? Where are those contact points? 
Absolutely. So www.docsf.health, D-O-C-S-F.health. We're part of the .health network. www.docsf.health is our website. The registration link is on the front page. It's pretty straightforward. And the dates of the event are April 23rd and 24th. It's structured to be in the morning from like 7.30 to about 12.30 so that it matches both the West Coast United States, the way to Europe, so it's accessible to everybody. And it will be available on demand to people who register. So we're pretty excited about that. Excellent. Where can we find you online? I know you're pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter. Where are those handles at? Right. So absolutely. So it's Stefano Beanie MD on LinkedIn. So S-T-E-F-A-N-O. That's an F, not a P-H. S-T-E-F-A-N-O-B-I-N-I-M-D on LinkedIn. And my Twitter handle is at SBeanieMD. Easy enough. And all those contact points online will be in the episode notes, including where to register for the conference here in April of 2021. And you can head over to the episode notes, simply scroll down in your podcast player to find those links, or you can head over to our free global online community at passionatepioneers.com. There will be a post for this episode. We can also leave some comments, suggestions, ideas, and feedback for Stefano and his team, again, over at passionatepioneers.com. Well, Stefano, as I mentioned at the very top of this, we could turn this into a definite mm-hmm. series of episodes with all the incredible work that you help lead, the mission you have around bringing more health to our communities across the world. I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm so thrilled that we had a chance to sync up today, but I do have one more part and we'll get you out of here so you can keep going and causing all that good trouble. It's a fill in the blank and it's, I'm a passionate pioneer because? I'm a passionate pioneer because I see the potential for digital health tools to transform the way we deliver care in orthopedic surgery. I love it. Absolutely. Well, with you helping lead the charge, I know there is no doubt that we will continue to bring the convergence of digital therapeutics and orthopedics together. Now is the time. There's great opportunity, as you mentioned earlier, and so excited for our community to learn about all of that and getting involved in your mission and work over at DocSF. But for now, Dr. Beanie, thank you so much for being with us today, taking the time to come and share your journey, your mission, and your passion And thank you again for all the wonderful work. Again, huge fan of yours. I'm so grateful we were able to sync up today. Thank you for being with us. Awesome. I had such a great time. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for letting me share this mission we're doing with DocSF and with your community. We're excited to have you guys on board. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode.